How are you? That's fantastic. Let's give it up again for the Christ Universal Temple Ensemble, the Temple Musicians, for that fantastic uh, medley. How are you all doing this morning? That's good, wonderful, good, all of that great and beautiful stuff. Uh, just before I begin, I do want to, uh, again, say thank you to the men expressing Christ for uh, helping us with love and action. Now, give it to them. Give it to them like you mean it now. Come on. Come on. Yeah, give it to them like you mean it. And also, uh, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you because uh, for Operation Love in Action, we have collected more than 1,000 cases of water to send up to Flint, Michigan. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, for, um, thank you for helping us to be a part of the solution uh, when we can and where we can. We are, uh, yeah, I know that's right. <laughs> we are uh, working from uh, this uh, guide to success that was penned by uh, Dennis Kimbrough. And uh, I, I really do want to encourage you, if you don't have it on your shelf, to get it from the bookstore. If you do have it on your shelf, uh, do go back and grab it. Because not only is it chock full of principles by which you can, again, craft a life that works for you, it's also a really sound treatise on black history, right? One of the things that he does really, really well in this text is give us some insights of how uh, ancestors of ours have used these exact same principles and techniques to, uh, to make significant contributions, not just to the African American community, but to uh, humanity as a whole. So make sure that if you don't have it, you, you, you get it. And if you do have it, uh, pull it off the shelf, blow the dust off of it, and, and uh, just refresh yourself with, uh, with, this, with this writing. And I'm excited that he'll be here with us at the end of the month. Uh, so now, as we just go ahead and get rolling, I just want to jump right into it. And as I jump into it, I, I want to uh, reintroduce us on this morning to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is uh, a, a character from scripture or a person from scripture who uh, found himself, I think, in, in, under, with some very interesting circumstances. Nehemiah was uh, the cupbearer to the king in Persia. Uh, and it's interesting, I think, that as Nehemiah was just sort of minding his own business and, and working in the area that he was in, that God saw fit to place a desire in his soul, a desire that would take him away from the respectable role that he was in and place him into another role that would require some different things of him. See, you never know when God will just drop a desire into your soul and call you up out of the space that you're in so that you can begin to do a new and different thing. And you know, if you know like I know, it's, it's easy to gripe, it's easy to complain, it's easy to be the armchair quarterback who uh, says what they would do and should do. But uh, while it's easy to analyze and scrutinize and talk about the problem, it's not always easy to be a part of the solution. And so uh, what we have an opportunity to do is recalibrate ourselves and understand how it is we become a part of the solution. I don't know if you've seen this commercial that's running, uh, I think it's for cable TV right now, with the Settlers. Anybody familiar with the Settlers? The Settlers, the settlers is, a, is a family who, uh, based upon their own mindset and their own consciousness, have decided that while advances are happening all around them, they will settle for what they are most comfortable with. And it doesn't matter to them that they are out of step with what's happening. They have decided that they will settle for where they are because that's what they know. And I'm happy about this idea called Christ Universal Temple because this is not a place for settlers. This is a place for people who have come into the realization that irrespective of how good you got it, you can get it even better. And so as we just begin to uh, work with our bulletin, let's talk about desire and let's talk about faith and let's look at how it is we begin to uh, reactivate these so that we can, as we said earlier, just craft a life that works for you. How many of you are interested in having a life that works for you? 
Just seven? Just seven or eight of y'all? No, because, see, you try, no, you're trying to send me off. See, you're trying to send me off. You're trying to send me off. You're trying to send me off. Listen, anytime somebody asks you if you want something that you don't have, that's not the time to be quiet. That's the time to be like, yeah, I'll take some of that. I know y'all tripping. But we're going to trip together. Let's go. So, from your bulletin, the first bullet point says that desire is the starting point of all achievement. Let's take it together. Desire is the starting point of all achievement. That second point says that desire is God tapping at the door of your heart. And that's actually a statement that's taken from uh, H. Emily Cady's Lessons in Truth when she is unpacking what desire is. Desire, she says, is God tapping at the door of your heart, wanting to get in so that God can help us see and come into alignment with what God has in store for us. And so we understand that desire means that which is of the Father. So when we're talking about being in tune and being in alignment with our desire, we're really talking about realigning ourselves with that which God has prepared for us. Is that right? We understand that God gives the desire and then that the desire becomes an expression or an outpouring or the outpicturing of that which is the inmost part of our being, right? Desire is an onward impulse of the ever-evolving man and woman. See, if you don't want to do anything, if your intent is to be a settler, then you don't need desire. If your intention is to stay right where you are, you don't need a new impulse, a new idea, a new inspiration to stay where you are. Just keep stuff as it is and you can stay right where you are. But when you start praying for things to change and God sends you the catalyst for that change, it's important for us to know how to work with that. And so the desire, as they come to us, they come to us so that they might be a catalyst for change in our soul. The desire that God sends you is not about changing anybody else. It's for you. That's why God sent it to you. The desire is the earnest, intense intention that draws the whole of our being up out of the mortality of limited race consciousness and puts us into the joy and power that will enable us to appreciate the spiritual blessings that have been prepared for us. Still talking about desire. And as Nehemiah received the desire, it caused him to move out of the kingdom of King Artaxerxes and head back to his hometown in Jerusalem so that he could begin to build something that some people didn't want him to build. When, when Nehemiah headed back to Jerusalem, you do remember that there were some people who were just staunchly against him rebuilding this doggone wall. Every, everybody, 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 uh, everybody doesn't really want to see you build your relationship. Everybody is not interested in seeing you build a business that's profitable. Every, not everyone is interested in seeing you come up. There is a such thing as a crab in the barrel mentality. However unfortunate, it is a fact of the matter. The next bullet point says that success begins in the form of Success begins in the form of intense desire. As a student of the intensive teacher training program right here at Christ Universal Temple, that helped to crystallize my understanding of what the word intense meant. This was, this is, see, when we're talking about an intense desire, we're not talking about something you can do with your mind have focused on something that you're not sure about whether or not you want it or not. An intense desire requires that you be on fire with the thing that you say you want. 
An intense desire will not allow you to be marginal in consciousness or mediocre in your intention if you are really desiring to get something. Sometimes I think I speak with so much intensity, not because I just want you to get it, but because of where I come from. I know what it's like on the other side. And I know that just because you've been on the other side doesn't mean you have to stay on the other side. I thank God for the opportunity to be enlightened. And sometimes I just get excited and I just want to shout and I can jump out of my skin because if it can happen for me, it can happen for anybody. But the difference is that you can't be playing, and I said this last week, like you can't take your life as if you don't know what you want. See, if you're not sure about what you want, then anything will show up and anybody will show up. If you don't know what kind of relationship you want to have or what kind of marriage you want to have, then any old body will show up in your space. Some of us are attracting knuckleheads and crazy people and people who are out of their minds because we don't know what we want. We have not yet said to ourselves, I want somebody sane. I get that she's cute, but is she sane? I get that he's got shoulders like Adonis, but is he sane? We have not yet determined for ourselves, I want somebody who knows how to treat me like a lady. No, no. You have to be definite with the infinite. You got to say this to yourself and to the universe. Oh, can I just drop this in your soul real quick? But you have to first make sure that you intend to be what you say you want. I can't say I want somebody who knows how to treat me like a gentleman. And then I make it my business and my intention. Yeah, y'all know where I'm going. The saints got it. I can't stay there, saints. I got to move on. I can't stay. I got to move on. But success begins with an intense desire. Like, you have to be on fire with it. You can't can't be kind of so-so about it. You got to be on fire with it. Those of you who are in business, who have built successful businesses, you got to spend time and intensity and intention in your business. You can't, most startups die within the first seven years, and it's not because the people don't want to do it right. Sometimes it's just that they're pulled in too many directions. Your baby needs your attention. The thing that's in your soul, the desire that's been placed in your soul, Nehemiah could not build the wall if he had stayed in Persia. What does that mean? That means sometimes you have to get into the physical space that's consistent with where you say you want to be and what you say it is you desire. You can't send remotely or have a long distance relationship with God's desire in your soul. No. No. You got to be on fire with it, ladies and gentlemen. You got to, you you have to understand that even though doubters show up, those that are external and those that are internal, your intensity and your fire will sometimes be enough to douse douse the flames of criticism. But if you are not on fire with it, you can't inspire anybody else to be. You can't recruit somebody to a cause you sort of marginal about. Does that make sense? Let's keep going. Success begins in the form of an intense desire. But not everyone is willing to pay the price for success. As been said, as has been said many times, the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. <laughs> that next statement says, let's not be repressed or let us not repress our desire to succeed. It says, take it directly from your bulletin, do not repress your desire to succeed. Do not repress your desire to succeed. 
Why? Because sometimes we suppress the very thing or repress the very thing that we say we want. We pray for a particular thing. We pray for something to move. We pray for a breakthrough. And then when stuff starts to move, we start to get scared. And when we start to get scared, we retreat or we repress the desire that we've been praying for. Watch this. Oftentimes when we repress, know that you repress the desire as a safety mechanism. You repress the, the desire because just as you start to expand beyond your limited consciousness of yourself, sometimes you see the insight into the great big you. I thank God here again that a Reverend Coleman did not repress the desire of Christ Universal Temple just because she was not sure or afraid about what it would become. Where would we be? Where would we be if when the desire for this idea came, she pushed it back down, said no, Especially not if I got to deal with. I ain't, you filled in the blank. I didn't say anything. I said, I just said them. You filled in the blank. When she started, she wasn't dealing with you. She was dealing with other folk. Am I right about it? But you have to be willing to move beyond your own discomfort. If you repress the desire, when you repress the desire, it prevents the conscious seed from being transmuted in the subconscious nature. What am I saying? I'm saying anytime you repress the idea or the desire out of consciousness without allowing it to take the natural process by which the, the, the demonstration comes together through the way you think and the way you feel, you abort your blessing. Anytime you start to doubt or be afraid or be uncertain about what's possible for you, you say you want healing, but you're scared. Those two things don't match. And I get being scared. But one must rule over the other. See, the, the light of consciousness when placed in a dark space, will illuminate the space. But you have to consistently shine the light on the dark space. See, you know why you get afraid sometimes? So that you can see that there is fear. You know why you get jealous sometimes? So that you can see that there is jealousy. You know why you get angry sometimes? So you can see that there is anger. It's not so that you can redirect it on the person who is the cause of your anger. People don't make you angry. They just show, it, show you where it is in you. When... Abraham Maslow talks about how it is we progress. He says that we each progress through what he calls a, a hierarchy of needs. Meaning that in order for a soul development need to be met on one level, the level before it must be sufficiently satisfied before you can consciously and intentionally accept what is available for you in terms of what you need on the next level. Let me say it to you this way. We each have, according to him, some physiological needs. We each have a need to feel safe. We have a need to feel loved. We have a need to be esteemed. We have a need for self-actualization. And in order for the need to feel safe to be met, you must first have your physiological needs met. So let me say it to you this way you will have a difficult time feeling safe in this safe space if when you showed up you were hungry. Let me say it to you this way. Our children will have a difficult time 
in class when they are supposed to be learning if when they showed up at school, their stomachs were aching from being hungry. And so when the baser level need is not met, it becomes more difficult for the other needs to completely be actualized. Does that make sense? Why is that important? It's important because as you begin to work with the desires that God is giving you, you might be inclined to move to a lower level when you actually are planning to be on a different level. What am I saying? I'm saying that sometimes when we see what's available to us, rather than move into the love that it can attract and pull the thing to us, mm -hmm, rather than sit in the esteem that we understand ourselves to be when we say that I am one with God and I am one with all people and I am one with all life and I am all one with the one, rather than stand in the self-actualization of understanding who and what I am in truth, if I don't feel safe about my ability to make the demonstration, I will drop back into safety. Let me also say it this way. So sometimes we find ourselves engaged in relationships and in the relationship we intend to be esteemed but when the person doesn't know how to deal with us we drop back into love. The, the needing to be seen, the needing to be loved, the needing to be heard, we drop into a place of need rather than the place of esteem. We drop back into the place of humanity rather than the place of Christ. And so then the opportunity is for us to continue to evolve the soul. And what desire does is it gives you the opportunity to evolve your soul. So the desire is not solely about the thing that you say you want. Mm. The desire is really about encapsulating you in that which God has for you because whenever you start to walk with God, the walk with God brings you in up into self-actualization. Prayer brings you up into self-actualization. Fasting brings you up into self-actualization. Study helps you come up into self-actualization. So that rather than run from who you are, run to who you are. So don't repress your desire. When you repress it, when you push it back down, you're not helping yourself, you're actually harming yourself. Let's work with faith for a little bit. A bulletin says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Or maybe your bulletin doesn't say that. My note says that. Does it say that? Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We say that faith is the perceiving power of the mind linked with the power to shape and mold substance. So we understand then that faith, this, this power, this ability, this faculty, this capacity begins to move on the unformed. See, when you are interested in building a life that works for you or in walking into the life that works for you, it is necessary that you have faith as you take the journey into yourself. Because there are things about you that you see about you that if you start to read and believe in the report about what you see, you will misguide yourself about who you are and whose you are. And so it's important to have faith in the truth about you. It's important to be convinced and believe the truth about you. It's important to remind yourself of the truth about you. I know what they say about you, but who cares what they have to say about you? I'm talking about the true you. 
And so faith is our ability to see beyond what's showing up, recognizing that if we can see it with our faith, it is being molded so that it might show up to us. This is why, again, it's important that you be intense and consistent with what it is you say you want because your soul is always working to begin to craft and bring to you that which you say you desire. There is never an errant moment when it comes to the way you think. There is never an idle thought when it comes to how the universe is saying, yes, my child. There is never a word that's spoken that is idle. The stuff that you say has life. And it's shaping substance in a way that's consistent with the stuff that you say. And so faith knows that it is God's will that you have all the good that you desire. But when we talk about applied faith, applied faith gives us perspective, it gives us accurate analysis, analysis and it gives us the ability to forge ahead because applied faith helps us to see two things. It helps us to see where our faith is underdeveloped and where our faith is overdeveloped. When your faith is underdeveloped, put this in your notes. When your faith is underdeveloped, you have a tendency to distrust. When your faith is underdeveloped, you have a tendency to doubt. When your faith is underdeveloped, you have the tendency to be more skeptical. When your faith is underdeveloped, you have a tendency to be more suspicious. Why is this important? Because the external things are always going to present something to you, and you have to figure out what your default position is when it shows up a particular way. So when you visit the doctor's office and the doctor says, I don't know how, you tell, how to tell you this, but this is what you're faced with, what's your default? Is it... Whoa, is me? This is what's happening to me. Why is this happening to me? I can't believe this is happening to me. I've been to all these classes. I've, I've been to all these church studies. I've, I've read all these books. Why is this happening to me? Because you've been to all them classes and you've been to all those church services and, and you read all of those books. It's happening to you to help you prove the truth that you say you know. If you don't want it to happen to you, don't pick up no more books. If you don't want it to happen to you, don't go to no more classes. If you don't want it to happen to you, you put your finger up right now so you can tip out for whatever that means to you because when you sit in the midst of this, it begins to, in inculcate your soul and when it inculcates your soul the truth knows the truth and water always rises to its level and so you because of who you are know truth when you hear it but anytime you hear truth know that it starts to deal with that other stuff in you see when confronted with truth know that your doubt gets scared Know that when every time you read or affirm or get something true down in your soul, it starts to eat away at that ego a little bit. And the fake you wants to make sure that y'all can keep fake kicking it. You, 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 it to my, to my, to my, some, some of y'all know what it means to fake kick it, right? So, so somebody knows what it means to fake kick it, right? Make some noise if you know what it means to fake kick it. All right. You say, what does it mean? <laughs> so according to my cousin, you fake kick it whenever you hang out with somebody you don't really like. Right? So when... when when you call to talk about somebody else and when you hang up and you call to talk to the person y'all were just talking about, 
to talk about that person, that's fake kicking it. But we fake kick it in our souls. Uh huh. That's, that's the thing that's really important. When faith is overdeveloped, it makes us narrow-minded, dogmatic. When faith is overdeveloped, we have a difficult time hearing and understanding what's being communicated to us. But the fundamentals of faith are these. A positive mental attitude. Power-packed prayer. And self-suggestion. One of the first things that Nehemiah did when he got the desire to go and rebuild the wall was he began to get his mind right. Because what Nehemiah had to do was transform from a cupbearer to a wall builder. What does it require of you as you decide to lead and move into the areas that you say you desire? What does it require of you to have and live a healthy, happy, and prosperous life? Understand that your goals, your desires, your dreams always exacts something from you. So what does it require of you to lead in areas that you've never led before? What do you have to gain? But not only what do you have to gain, what do you have to give up? Who is with you now that can't go with you to wherever it is you go next? Take an inventory, you should know. Because if there are people who are not healthy enough for your journey, you will find that not only are they S-I-C-K, but because you're Hanging with folk who are S-I-C-K. You start to find yourself being a little. It requires a positive mental attitude. It requires power-packed prayer. It requires self-suggestion. This one is pretty straightforward. It simply asks, what do you say to you about you? What do you say to you about you? What's your conversation to you when you first wake up?